Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next session on model pair operation. So far, we have talked about uh, programming models in many different contexts, but it is important to know that having a model itself is not, uh, is not, uh, is not sufficient to represent a specific system. It is also very important that the model you have uh, uh, represents the system behavior accurately. Otherwise, if the models, uh, models we have produce results that show wide divergence from the observed outcomes, uh, such models are unacceptable. Therefore, modelers invest significant amount of effort uh, into calibrating programming models to better reproduce observed values of a base year or uh, an average of several years. In other words, model calibration is a process of finding a unique set of model parameters that provide a good description of the system behavior. Now we will start looking at this problem of model calibration or divergence of the model results from the reality. In a simple LP problem, we will see how we can calibrate this LP problem to represent the observed results much more accurately. And then we will discuss how the calibration is done for the Capri model. So let's consider the simple LP problem where a farmer has 200 hectares of land and 10,000 hours of labor. And the farmers should make a decision on how to allocate this land between four different crops, wheat, barley, rapeseed, and sugar wheat, in order to maximize his total gross margin. Given the following information on gross margin per hectare for each crop and on labor requirement in hours per hectare for each crop. The mathematical formulation of this problem will be as follows. So our objective function is to maximize the total gross margin subject to three constraints. The first one is the non-negativity constraints, meaning that the land allocated to each crop cannot be negative, the area of land. The land used, uh, the total amount of land used cannot exceed uh, the amount of land that we have. So we only have 200 hectares of land. And the labor constraint is that the total amount of labor used cannot exceed the amount of labor that we have. Now, please open the following Excel file. But, uh, in sheet LP, uh, try to solve this LP problem using four alternative sets of gross margins. Here is the formulation of the problem in Excel. As you can see in the following table, we have, uh, except the original scenario, we have four different scenarios with four different sets of gross margins. We want to solve this LP problem for all five sets of gross margins and store the results in the following table and compare afterwards how the results change when we make small changes in the gross margins. Here we have the formulation of our objective function and our constraints, labor constraint and land, cost, uh, and land constraint. We will use the Excel solver for solving this LP problem, which you can find under the data tab. And this is the solver. If you don't find it here, this means your Excel solver is not activated. Then you need to activate the solver add-in by going to File, Options, then Add-ins, and Manage Excel add-ins, then press Go, and please select the solver 
add in here and press OK. And your solver will appear under the data tab. Now let's solve the, pro uh, the problem for the original set of cross margins. Our objectives, uh, our objective here is the uh, sum of all cross margins, which is stored in, in the cell G12. We want to maximize it by changing the area devoted to each crop. And we have two constraints. The first one is the labor constraint that the used labor cannot exceed the available labor. And the second constraint is the land constraint that the land plantage cannot exceed the amount of land that we have. We also have a non-negativity constraint, with which we ensure by selecting this box here, which makes the, uh, our variables non-negative. Since we have a LP problem, we use a simplex LP solver. And we solve. The first set of the results that we receive is as follows. So the allocation of land. The, so, uh, the solver suggests us to uh, allocate 145 hectares of land to barley and 55 hectare, hectares of land to sugar beet and zero for wheat and rapeseed. Let's save this set of results in the following table. And solve the problem for the next set of cross margins. As we can see, when we changed the gross margins, uh, actually in this case, we increase the gross margins for wheat and rapeseed. And now I want to see if the solver allocates any land to wheat and rapeseed. But as we see, the solution has not changed yet. So let's save this set of gross margins in the folder again, and proceed to solving the problem with the next set of gross margins. Here again, we try to increase the gross margins for wheat and rapeseed. And try to solve it once more. However, we still see that the land allocation has not changed under the first third scenario. Let's increase the gross margin for wheat and grapes it again a bit more. And try to solve the problem again. In this case, <clears throat> we see that the allocation of land changed completely. In this scenario, the solver suggests us planting zero hectares of wheat, zero hectares of barley, 120 hectares of rapeseed and 77 hectares of sugar beet. And let's solve the problem one last time for the last set of scenarios. In this scenario, we again increase the uh, gross margins for wheat and rapeseed. And let's see how the allocation changes. In this case, the solver decided to allocate all the available land to rapeseed. <clears throat> 
So by solving the LP problem with different sets of gross margins, we end up with the following land allocation decisions, depending on the gross margin. However, in this solution, we observe over-specialization and some strange jumps from one crop to another. And in general, there is a wide divergence between those results and actual production patterns observed because farmers also plant crops that are less productive for different reasons, such as government regulations, crop rotation practices, risk aversion, etc. Yes, therefore, policy analysis based on such results would not be very convincing. To overcome the problem of overspecialization and to reflect more re realistic behavior of farmers, we can use the, the positive mathematical programming, which is a methodology that calibrates programming models to observed quantities in the base year by using the information contained in the dual values of the calibration constraints and by sp uh, specifying new nonlinear objective functions. In general, positive mathematical programming is operationalized in three steps. The first step is to force the model to reproduce the observed activity levels by bounding the LP problem to the observed activity levels. The second step is to use the dual values or the shadow prices of, uh, of the constraints in order to uh, modify our objective function. And the final step is to solve the new program, the new model with this new uh, nonlinear objective function, which will supposedly produce more realistic behavior of the system. Let us consider the following profit maximizing LP problem, where where z is the value of our objective function. P is the matrix of uh, product prices. X is the, ve uh, is the vector of uh, production activity levels. K is the vector of accounting costs per unit of activity. And uh, this objective function is subject to the, to the following constraints. First, we have our resource constraint, which uh, we were a is the matrix of coefficients in resource constraints, and B is the vector of available resources, and lambda is the vector of dual values associated with the resource constraints. However, we already observed in our Excel exercise that such model specification yields to over-specialization. Therefore, we will extend this LP problem to a PMP problem to avoid this issue of over specialization. And as, already, as I already mentioned, the first step of transforming this LP problem into a PMP problem is to force the model to reproduce the observed activity levels in the base year. And to do so, we include an additional constraint here, which is in red, that forces the model to produce the activity levels observed in the base year. So here, x null is the vector of observed activity levels in the base year, and e is a small uh, error term uh, of, uh, so basically it's a vector of small positive numbers. And the row here, is the, dual, is the vector of the dual values associated with the calibration constraints. So in this case, we, uh, we, have, uh, we can differentiate between two constraints, the resource constraints and the calibration constraint. Now we can divide our activities denoted by x here into two groups. The first group is the, uh, is the marginal activities denoted by xm. So those are the activities that are constrained by the resource constraints. And consequently, the dual values for the calibration constraints for the marginal activities are equal to zero. And the second group of activities include the 
preferable activities. And those are the activities that are constrained by the calibration constraints. In the second step, the dual, uh, the dual values of the preferable activities are used to modify the objective function such that the marginal cost you know, of the preferable activities is equal to their respective prices at the base year. To modify the objective function, the general variable costs uh, uh, function is employed, which has the following form with the following linear term and quadratic term. The D and Q are consequently the parameters of a linear and quadratic cost terms. The dual values of the calibration constraints obtained in the first step now are used to specify those parameters D and Q. And these parameters are then specified such that the marginal variable cost fulfills the following condition. In the final step, by plugging in our quadratic cost function into the objective function, we obtain our nonlinear programming problem that uh, reproduces observed activity levels. As you can see, here uh, again, uh, we only have the resource constraint and the, uh, and the calibration constraint is, uh, is not uh, specified in the final form of our linear problem anymore. Now the only remaining issue is how to specify the D and Q parameters of our quadratic objective function. There are many different ways of specifying those D and Q, uh, Q parameters. Uh, I, here I will introduce four of them. In the early days of PMP, the specification problem with respect to the quadratic cost function was simply solved by letting d equal to k, which is, uh, which is our cost, costs, and q calculated as follows. This, uh, this specification is purely motivated by computational simplicity in the absence of additional information. However, based on some ex post simulations, it was later found that this approach results in a very poor response behavior of the resulting model, characterized by strong overreactions to changes in economic incentives. The next approach is the average cost approach. In comparison to the standard approach, which was the previous one, the parameters of the quadratic cost term here are la get larger, which implies a reduced price elasticity. The third one is the Paris approach. Paris was a famous scientist in the field of mathematical programming, and, the, and he suggested the following specification. So, in his specification, he simply sets the parameter d equal to zero and calculates q using the following specification. Although this is a generally more realistic property of producer response, the quantitative, uh, the quantitative specification remains somewhat arbitrary for this approach. And the final approach, approach the exogenous elasticities approach, uh, uh, yeah. This is, uh, this is somewhat um, a more convincing specification because it incorporates exogenously uh, uh, estimated elasticities into calculating our D and Q parameters. Now let's move to more practical exercises in the same Excel file that you had already opened uh, to solve the LP problem. We have five additional sheets in, the, in this Excel file with the following titles, PMP revealed dual values. This is the LP problem that we will uh, solve to obtain the dual values of our calibration constraints, and then use these calibration constraints to specify our D and Q parameters for solving our transformed PMP uh, problem with uh, four different specifications, the standard specification, the average cost specification, Paris specification, the exogenous elasticity specification. 
here is our original LP problem that we want to transform into a PMP problem. In this case, we have a linear objective function subject to prices and costs. But in addition here, we also have data on observed land allocation in the base here. And as you remember, the first step of converting our LP problem into a PMP problem is to force the model to reproduce the values uh, of, the, uh, of our decision variables in the base year. For that purpose, we add here four additional constraints for each crop, forcing the land allocation for those crops to be less than or equal to the land allocation in the observed year. Then by solving this, we, will, we can use the shadow prices of those calibration constraints to specify our D and Q parameters. Now let's solve this uh, first LP problem to obtain our shadow prices. Our objective set is our profit. The decision variables are our land allocation variables. And we have in this case, six different constraints. The first one is the land constraint. The second one is the labor constraint. And the calibration constraints for each crop, for wheat, for barley, for rapeseed, and of course for sugar beet. We have our non negativity constraint as well, and we use a simplex LP solver. Now let's solve it. And also we want to obtain a sensitivity report. Therefore, let's select the sensitivity here under the report and click OK. As you can see, our decision variables are equal to the values in the observed year. Now let's look at the sensitivity report. So the values we want to use from the sensitivity report are the shadow prices or are of our calibration constraints that are this. So let's copy those to uh, all four sheets uh, specifying our different PMP approaches. And as you can see, as we paste those values here, our uh, Q parameters obtain some values because the Q parameters are calculated based on those shadow prices. Same for the Paris approach and for the exogenous elasticities approach. Now let's start solving our PMP exercise using the values obtained from the original LP model. In this case, now, as you can see, we have a modified objective function, which is now a quadratic objective function, also subject to the parameters T and Q here. However, as you can notice, we don't have our calibration constraints here any longer, so we don't force our decision variables to be equal to the observed uh, values of the land allocation in the base here. However, we only have land and labor constraints. Let's solve this PMP problem with the standard uh, specification. And let's add our two constraints, the land constraint and the labor constraint. However, remember that now we don't have an LP problem. We have an NLP problem, nonlinear problem. Therefore, we need to choose a nonlinear solver and solve it. As you can see, in this case, our model reproduce, reproduced the values of land allocation in the observed year without uh, us having the additional constraints to force the model to reproduce those values 
Let's also solve the problem with the other specifications. Let's see if they also are able to reproduce the observed values. Let's add our constraints. And so, as you can see, again, uh, using the average cost approach, we are able to reproduce our observed values in the base here. Let's do the same with the Paris approach. Again, we are able to reproduce our values in the observed here. Let's also solve uh, our PMP problem with the fine, uh, with our last uh, specification, which is the exogenous elasticity specification. As you can see, in this case, except the data on the shadow prices of the resource constraints, we also have data on on price elasticities of our crops, which are exogenously estimated. Now let's solve our PMP problem with this example and add our length and labor constraints. And see if the results are reproduced. As we can see, our uh, model is, was again able to reproduce uh, the uh, values of land allocation in the observed year. Now, please go ahead and solve these PMP examples with four different specifications using all the four different price sets that are four different scenarios. And then later we will compare how the land allocation changes in, when we make changes in prices. Please take 15 minutes to finalize this exercise. Here we have the same PMP exercises implemented in GAMS. In addition to our four different PMP approaches that we already discussed during the Excel exercise here, we also have the Capri uh, approach of the uh, calibration of the supply models. So in this case, we have, uh, uh, we have the standard approach referred to as Hobbit underscore 11. We have the average cost approach referred to as Hobbit underscore 12. We have the Paris approach, we have the exogenous elasticity approach, and we have the Capri approach. Basically, the Capri approach of uh, calibrating the supply models is very similar to the exogenous elasticity approach. However, in order to satisfy the condition that the marginal costs should be equal to the uh, marginal revenues at the calibration point, uh, the shadow prices of two critical constraints in Capri are set exogenously, and those constraints are the land balance and the milk quotas. Now let's solve the model and compare the results uh, obtained from different PMP approaches and see how uh, each of these uh, PMP approaches uh, what is the ability of this uh, each PMP approach to revert to uh, replicate the system behavior observed in the base year. In this case, we also export the, uh, the results uh, to a GTX file. So this will give us more flexibility to analyze the results. So let's open the GTX file generated by the model. Now let's look at the results. So here on the top window, we see uh, our four different scenarios, the S0 scenario, which is our reference scenario where we try to replicate the observed values in the base year. And then the S1 to S4 scenarios are the uh, results obtained with different price levels. 
Let's, for example, look at the first scenario. As we can see in the uh, LP, uh, in, the, in the results obtained by the LP method, we see uh, over specialization and some uh, avoidance of uh, two of the crops. In the case of the standard approach and the average cost approach, we, uh, we see improvement over the LP method. However, there is still a poor uh, uh, replication of the observed behavior of the system from the, from the base year. In the case of the Paris approach, we see some improvement over the standard approach and the average cost approach. However, the, there is still some divergence from the observed values. In the case of the exogenous price elasticities, we don't see this overreaction to changing prices. Now we still see some uh, changes, but they are not as severe as in the other cases. And the results obtained by this PNP approach are yeah, much closer to the results observed in the base year, uh, meaning that this method was able to replicate the observed behavior of the system much more accurately. As we can see, uh, in the results obtained by the Capri method, uh, the system behavior is not, is not much different from the system behavior uh, uh, replicated by the exogenous elasticity approach in all four scenarios. So here as well, in the second set of the prices, we see similar behavior in all five uh, PNP approaches. In the first scenario as well, and in the fourth scenario. <laughs> 